You British and the French are like the two edges of a pair of shears. And we are the cloth which is cut to pieces between them. Odawa. By the mid-1700s, the Indian nations of the eastern interior were surrounded by European powers. Spain controlled Florida. The English were pressing in from their colonies in the east. And the French were aggressively moving across the Great Lakes and along the Mississippi River. Spurred by the increasingly lucrative fur trade, along with valuable farmlands, North America was seen by the Europeans as a commercial prize. To win it, the French and English established military outposts throughout the interior to support their trading ventures and solidify their claims to the land. This idea of encroachment and land ownership and so forth was so foreign to us that we couldn't understand it. As individuals, we couldn't understand it. It was carving up our mother's breast. It was, it was parceling out the land and the air above it to individual ownership. In 1754, France and England clashed for control over the continent in what would become known as the French and Indian War. From Europe, the American conflict was seen as a distant chess match for territory, power, and trade, with Indian nations mere fighting pawns. But in America, the interior Indian nations saw their homelands turned into violent battlegrounds. Why do not you and the French fight in the old country and on the sea? Why do you come to fight in our land? Shingas Lanape. Most Indian nations joined the war on the side of the French. We had a very close affinity to the French people. The reason is because they had they had no designs on our on our territory. They were not out to colonize. If they wanted to live with us, they married into the tribe and they lived with us and they were welcome. On the other hand, at the other end of the scale, the English are notorious for being colonists. They don't want the sun to set on the British Empire, so they want colonies everywhere. And, and this new world was no different. That's why they came. In 1760, after six years of war, the French shocked their Indian allies in the Ohio Valley and the Western Great Lakes by abruptly withdrawing from the region. While the French continued to fight for other parts of the continent, here the English army moved into their abandoned forts unopposed. Englishmen, although you have conquered the French, you have not yet conquered us. We are not your slaves. These lakes, these woods and mountains were left to us by our ancestors. They are our inheritance and we will part with them to none. One Odawa man, who had fought alongside the French, then watched them retreat, refused to abandon the struggle. His name was Pontiac. On the night he was born, there was snow and rain and winds. There was lightning and thunder, and there were shooting stars. And all of the phenomena that was taking place that night the elders said that there was a great person being born. While many leaders saw the English as a threat to their nations, Pontiac saw the English as a threat to all Indian people. Nations had to put aside the past and unite in common purpose. Pontiac's vision would change the thinking of Indian leaders for generations. So what he did was to organize his own thoughts and then organized his own people and then other tribes, got them together with what undoubtedly had to be great oratory and great diplomatic uh, uh, moves and skills to get people, some of whom were his bitter enemies, our tribe's bitter enemies. We fought the Hurons for hundreds of years. We fought the Shawnees. We fought many of these tribes. He went around and, and, and got them to become part of what's known as Pontiac's Confederacy. It is important for us, my brothers, 
that we exterminate from our land this nation which only seeks to kill us. When I go to the English chief to tell him that some of our comrades are dead, instead of weeping, he makes fun of me and of you. When I ask him for something for our sick, he refuses and tells me that he has no need of us. There is no more time to lose, and when the English shall be defeated, we shall cut off the passage so they cannot come back to our country. Pontiac, Odawa. Fighting men from the Anishinaabe, Miami, Seneca, Lenape, Shawnee, and other nations responded to his call. In May of 1763, Pontiac's rebellion erupted with the siege of Fort Detroit. Over the next two months, nine of the 11 English forts in the region fell. Only Detroit and Fort Pitt remained in British hands, both under siege by Pontiac's alliance. When he started taking the British forts, and he took them one by one, cut off the security of the colonists. Then they were on their own. Then his vision was that once we get the last one, once we get Detroit, we will start and we will just kind of herd them ahead of us like ducks or geese, right back to the Atlantic Ocean. Pontiac stood on the verge of total victory. With France still in control of Louisiana and the Mississippi, local French residents assured him that French forces would soon return to the region to help him drive out the English once and for all. But unknown to Pontiac, France had already signed a treaty of surrender in Paris, ending all hostilities between the two colonial powers in North America. Rumors of the accord reached Pontiac in June at the height of his triumph, but he refused to believe that the French would not respond to his victories. The British army, freed from campaigns against the French, launched massive expeditions against the Indian forces. But Pontiac's alliance held their ground. Increasingly desperate to prevail, British commander Geoffrey Amherst put a bounty on Pontiac's head, then proposed a sinister tactic, germ warfare. Could it not be contrived to send the smallpox among those disaffected tribes of Indians? We must, on this occasion, use every stratagem in our power to reduce them. You will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, to try to extirpate this execrable race. Shawnee, Lenape, and Odawa were crippled by smallpox-infested blankets from Fort Pitt. Pretty soon burst out a terrible sickness among us. Lodge after lodge was totally vacated. Nothing but the dead bodies lying here and there in their lodges. Entire families being swept off with the ravages of this terrible disease. In October, confirmation of the French surrender reached Pontiac and his allies. The news was a decisive blow to the momentum of the rebellion. Now they knew that help would never come. Pontiac called off the siege of Detroit and retired with his people to their winter camps. The next spring, he tried to rally forces for another push against the English, but his efforts were ineffective. Many Indian nations were encouraged by English promises that settlements would never be allowed on their land. They were also anxious to normalize relations and to resume European trade. With the passage of another year, Pontiac was a leader without a following. His moment had passed. The British forts were there to stay. In 1769, only six years after the incredible success of his campaign against the British, Pontiac died, murdered in the ancient Indian center of Cahokia. 
But his life had not been in vain. His vision of united Indian nations would echo through the region and across the coming decades. The idea didn't die. The idea that, that Pontiac had implanted with these other leaders and these other tribes prevailed. Pontiac's life was a message to the future. But before the nations of the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley would rise again, the continent would be embroiled in another costly war, this time between the American colonists and their king. 